Newsmaker Sunday with Fox 10's John Hook. Thanks for being with us on Newsmaker Sunday. He is the police chief uh, presiding over the 38th largest city in the country. And um, this is a big job for Frank Nolstead. He is the chief of police for the city of Mesa. He's been on the job since uh, 2010 leaving Phoenix PD after 25 years of service there. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks First for time me, on John. the program. Yes, sir, it is. Tell me, you, you did 25 years for the city of Phoenix. How did that translate? What did you learn in those 25 years that has translated to the current position as Chief of Mesa? Phoenix was a, a very fast-growing city, fast-growing police department. Um, it was very competitive inside. There's an incredible amount of very bright, motivated, hardworking men and women there that everything would, to get around, to go to special assignments, to get promoted, everything was a competition. Uh, and it was, and it was a highly contested competition. And I would tell you the same thing I tell anybody else. The 25 years at Phoenix PD was a PhD in problem solving and leadership. Uh, and I owe them everything that I have today to be where I am and to be prepared to lead uh, a department uh, like Mesa. How's it different in Mesa? You know, it's smaller, it's a little calmer, there's a little bit more of a sense of community uh, in Mesa. Not as much action? No, not, well, you know what, the guys in the street are running from call to call to call. Um, it is a very lean department, uh, but not as much violence and with our current policing models I think we're targeting the right offenders those who uh, are continually committing crimes day in and day out and that is keeping the violence in the city at a, at a record low if you told somebody from across the country uh, I live in Mesa they might what might come to mind is Mormon community bedroom community suburb of Phoenix right. do you have gang activity in Mesa we do. Uh, it's not nearly as intense as what we had in Phoenix. Um, we have uh, a very large gang squad. There's actually three different squads that deal with gangs, uh, which keeps that at a minimum. So uh, there's also gangs. We, you know, we border the Salt River Pima Indian community, mm -hmm. and there are gangs that uh, that come into Mesa to commit crimes and then go back onto the reservation. Uh, and so we deal with some of those as well, and we have a very good working relationship with that police department. I should mention you're the vice chairman of ACTIC, which is the Arizona Counterterrorism Information Center, and this is really the clearinghouse for trying to combat any any uh, uh, parts sources of terrorism that, that may uh, creep their way into, into Arizona. In the Boston bombing, uh, as of Thursday, um, two suspects identified. Yes, sir. Your sense of how safe we are compared to the rest of the country, do you feel that Arizona is not a target, probably not a target for terrorists, or do you think that that is just uh, foolish to think that? Uh, I think you're unwise to think that things can't happen in Arizona. Um, I also think that it's unwise to change your lifestyle and who you are because of the things that happen uh, in society. Uh, the big deal is that if you see something, you have to say something, and you have to be as perceptive as you can uh, as you're out and going to events. But don't let it change your life. Uh, we have that freedom to do those things. Is this, is this something now that you preach when you go out and speak to community uh, gatherings, community forums, to really urge the public to be your eyes and ears absolutely our staffing models are at the lowest they've been in years uh, and that's in any city in, in the region uh, or in the nation for that matter we do count on the public and I would credit the citizens of Mesa for one of the reasons that our crime is at a 60-year low is they trust the police department the men and women on the street are working hard every day and they call us when they see something suspicious so we can investigate it let's take a look at tape number two you've had uh, a pretty significant case of of arsons that went over a 15-month period um, so you guys were chasing these guys around trying to figure out who was setting fires in Mesa you ended up arresting a 20 year old a 19 year old a 19 year old and an 18 year old now, these are young guys uh, the four accused of using a butane torch to set fire to cars landscaping sheds and houses you ended up kind of catching these guys right because you found a person of interest and just tailed them we did. Uh, we did some covert operations working with these uh, gentlemen. We made some uh, drug buys from them and right. we befriended them. Uh, and that is how we begin to learn about their uh, continuous and past transgressions. What, what, what was the point of their fires? Do we know? 
Uh, I think they like burning things. That's I, it. I mean, I don't think it's any more complicated than that, as weird as that sounds. They like burning things. They like uh, uh, wreaking havoc uh, on the community. Um, Speaking of covert operations, when you were with Phoenix PD, you were involved in the uh, serial shooter case. Yes, sir. Dale Hausner, uh, Sam Dietman. Um, you had to do some covert things in that case, too. That's when you were with Phoenix PD. That's correct. And I, I, at the, I'll be honest, I was only at the end of the serial shooter case uh, the last uh, maybe few weeks. Uh, we had just come off of working. Uh, uh, I was a lieutenant at the time working the baseline killer case, which we had spent nine months right. on. You worked that case, too. And then six months prior to that, we had worked the AM rapist who had raped 11 women in North Phoenix, uh, and we had resolved that case. So. Uh, my time uh, as a lieutenant working the Safe City Task Force uh, was very involved in some serial events going on in the city of Phoenix and uh, very complicated investigations. And you, yeah, and you guys have to do some things. I mean, do you, do you believe that, and, and we're getting through this, this argument right now in the Boston case, that there are, and I think even the public will say, there are some things that you've got to hold back. Now, for me to say this is a media guy, this is heresy. But I do understand that there are some things you guys have to hold back to not compromise an investigation. Well, and I think the public forgives us for that when they realize that we have to do certain things. You know, we, we don't give up uh, our secret recipes for solving certain crimes. Uh, we do hold back information because we don't want to tip anybody off or we give out information to see what that does. Um, there's tactics that are used and everyone's forgiving if it's used properly. I mean, if it was just to deny people public access, I think we would all pay dearly for that. The but biggest, that's not the case. The biggest case you have kind of walked into, and it started before your tenure, is the Jody Arias murder trial. Right. A crime that happened in Mesa, the killing of her ex-boyfriend, uh, Travis Alexander, that's not in dispute. She killed him. The question is, is it going to be first or second degree murder, and is it going to be the death penalty? Right. I want to take you back to that case. This is tape number one, if you will, just to take you back as to where we've been in that case. The Arias jury losing another juror. The judge made the announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, juror number 11 is ill. The court has excused him from further participation in this trial. Meanwhile, more tough questions from jurors aimed at psychotherapist Alice LaViolette, an expert witness testifying for the defense. LaViolette said Jody was a victim of domestic violence and labeled Travis's insults directed at her as, quote, an assassination of the soul. This juror's question, read by the judge, compared Travis's violence with Jody's. On the one side, we have demeaning multiple verbal slurs, a slap, a shove, a chokehold, and a lunge perpetrated on Jody. On the other, we have a gunshot to the head, a four inch deep slit throat. Not this a long time. This, is, uh, this case is sensational. Have you ever seen anything like it? Has Mesa ever seen anything like it? No, this is probably the second most significant case to come out of Mesa in recent memory. Um, Mikkel Biggs. Mikkel Biggs, yes, and it's an unsolved uh, missing child. Uh, but this case, because of its salacious nature, I think the police work sometimes gets overlooked in the work of the lab uh, people. Your, your guys, um, refresh my memory, who did the interrogation on that case? Uh, Detective Flores. Unbelievable job. Excellent interrogation, uh, the way that he was able to lock her into stories and then let her work her way back out of them and then lock her into another story uh, was very well done. Do you watch it with interest or do you kind of, is it when you're on the inside, you kind of know the nuts and bolts and you don't need to follow it every day? You know. I do watch what goes on. Uh, every day, somebody from the public information office is usually there in trial, paying attention to what's going on. Uh, Are you being asked for interviews as well? Uh, yes, and I've just been pushing those off to uh, the public information officers. You're there's, talking about the inside additions and those kind of... Right, there's, okay. th there's no need for my input on that, in my opinion. Uh, maybe when it's over, uh, just to talk about the great work that uh, they all did, uh, that might be something that's appropriate, but uh, just to speak on the news isn't really my piece. Do you think, just give me a guess, do you think she may get the death penalty over this? I do, yes. You do? Yes. You don't think the jury's going to be swayed by all of this stuff? Oh, there's a lot of misdirection going on. No, the only reason I say that I, is really the jury questions. Those questions right. lead me down a different path than I get uh, when I'm watching the trial. Let me ask you a little bit, if we can roll tape number three. Your department is, um, boy, 
You've got about 1,200 men and women in your department? Yes, sir. But compared to Phoenix, that's about a third, roughly, yes. of what Phoenix PD has. So just in numbers, I mean, does, does everybody kind of know each other in that department, where in Phoenix that may not be the case? Yeah, that is very true, and I think that's part of the reason there's a lot of camaraderie at Mesa uh, and a more of a family atmosphere. Um, it's really illustrated. We actually have a family appreciation day when the, the community comes out and provides food and entertainment for the officers. One day we put it at our training facility. There were 3,000 people, 3,500 people at it this year. Um, those kind of events didn't happen at Phoenix. There wasn't that close-knit yeah. group. What is the one thing as, as chief where you look at it and say, boy, before I leave this job, we are going to solve this. What is this? I hope it's staffing. I hope that we can get enough men and women out on the street where there's agility in the workforce that the officers when they want to take a vacation or get time off they can they can actually leave and get away from the the day in and day out grind of the duties um, and I would like to see us catch up on our technology we continue to push technology but we're stifled in its growth strictly by budget issues there's an interesting piece of technology that you guys have been working and that's this fingerprint recognition technology that yes. you guys started off as I recall, was six units. Correct. And now you've expanded that. Basically, this gets out of the name game, right? Correct. Where a suspect gives you a false name, and you got to figure out who is this guy or who is this woman. Tell me how that all works. It's two finger fast ID. It's a company called Morpho. Uh, is it in your cars? It's or in is our it a cars. portable device. In fact, uh, when I left the station today, a headquarters, they were installing more of them as 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 of today. Uh, I think we're up to. 30 units that are out in the field now. Uh, they're in the cars, and you, when you say the name game, I don't think a lot of people know what that is, but people do lie to the police about who they're... Who, <laughs> You're kidding uh, me. I know, uh, <laughs> about who they are. Right. Uh, but with, uh, with putting two fingers, it runs it through our automated finger indexing system, uh, and it'll tell us who you are, whether you are wanted, uh, what your past transgressions are, if you have a record, whatnot. So um, for those people who are not identifiable or are trying to lie to the police to uh, conceal something uh, this is a great way to and again it's about efficiency let, let me ask you since we are in the middle of this immigration debate um, what happens in Mesa if you come across somebody let's say through that fingerprinting say we we have really high degree of of suspicion that this person is here illegally what happens in Mesa versus well you don't even need to get in versus Phoenix but what do you do in Mesa well I can tell you this today uh, we have not had to enforce any part of 1070. I don't think that we've made one arrest reference 1070. Uh, what the community wants from us, and I think what the politicians want from us is that we work off of a criminal predicate. If you're a criminal, and it doesn't matter where you're from, they don't want you in the community, we, we want to arrest you and get you out. Um, the law is very interesting in the fact that you can't use language, you can't use skin color, you can't use a lot of the things that people would jump to conclusion that you were here illegally. You, uh, those biases cannot be used. You're forbidden from using them, actually. Correct. So let's just deal with crimes. Uh, we do roundups with ICE. ICE comes into Mesa and we pick up violent gang offenders. Are there, are there a fair amount of illegal immigrants here in, in Mesa? Yeah, sure. I think they're in all of our communities. I mean, there's 11. They say there's 11 million illegal people in, in the, the country. States, so right. we all got to have our share. Um, I can tell you this though: that out of everybody that we book into the Mesa City Jail, only about six percent, five and a half percent of those are out of status. And if you look at the number in the county jail, the Maricopa County Jail, everybody that gets booked in there from all over the region, because all the police departments use that jail, I think it hovers around nine percent. So. A lot of times you'll hear people say that uh, illegals are responsible for 90% of the crimes. Well, that's not true, right. and, and, the num and the numbers don't bear that to be true. When we come back with Chief Milstead, the uh, Chief of Police for City of Mesa, we're going to talk about a story that, that we were involved in uh, just a few months ago about a guy who was taken down on the hot pavement outside of uh, Golfland Sunsplash. And get the Chief's take on that story and where that case stands now. Back on Newsmaker Sunday with Chief Milstead. Injured? Visit PhillipsLaw.com. Phillips Law Group, Arizona's law firm. An ugly custody battle. I made you! Why did you recant? With partners taking sides. Law and Order. SVU. Viewer discretion advised. Monday at 7.
Family Guy's rules for good parenting. Build self-esteem. Everyone's gonna make fun of me! Come on, who's gonna make fun of you? Hey, Fatty, I hear you're going to fat camp. Supervise playtime. Hey, Lois, that not Stewie kid fell over. And teach valuable lessons. Well, I thought if you do something wrong, you're supposed to get punished. Oh, Chris, not if you're white. Add some laughs to your parenting formula. I didn't ask to be in this family. With Family Guy, your discretion advised. A full hour, weeknights at 5 on My 45. Yep. 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 Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Boo-hoo! Ah! Yep. Whoa. Oh, yeah! Yep. 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 Shiny! Yep. 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 Oh. King of the Hill rules. A full hour, weekdays at 4 on My 45. Oh, yeah! Who <laughs> let the Nard Dog out? <laughs> Love that Andy, right? <laughs> Solid fellow. Seems smart enough. I went to Cornell. You ever heard of it? He has got this very likable way about him. Even a lot of men can't resist a man singing show tunes. Attend the tale of Sweeney Todd. Characters that are just your type. Five times a week on The Office. A full hour, weeknights at 9 on My 45. Back on Newsmaker Sunday with Mesa Police Chief Frank Milstead. On June 10th of last year, a guy by the name of Chris Simpson was um, taken down by your officers outside of Golfland Sunsplash. He's now suing for $17 million, talking about the burns that he suffered. Uh, and his at attorney, Buddy Rake, uh, we interviewed as well on this piece. I want to show you just a little segment of it, and then I'll get your reaction to it, because you were part of the original piece. It was a long story that, that we aired on Fox 10. I was a reporter on the piece. Take a look at this. This is about the takedown in Mesa. Mesa's Golfland Sunsplash, a place for family and fun where memories are made. On June 10th of last year, Chris Simpson hoped he would create a lasting memory here with his dying father. But the only lasting thing from that day are horrible scars from burns Chris suffered on hot asphalt after he was taken down in the parking lot by Mesa police. Well, I thought it was over. I thought they were taking me out, you know. Chris planned to meet his father in the park that day. His father was dying of pancreatic cancer. Chris was already in a fragile emotional state. I was a little depressed, um, despondent. I mean, I, I didn't feel very good about myself, you know what I mean? I wasn't, I was depressed. He snuck into the park that day without paying, stole a piece of pizza. Chris was not on drugs. He wasn't drunk. But when his father failed to show up, Chris began acting out. He made a scene when he jumped into an inner tube in the Lazy River, fully clothed. He made bizarre statements such as, I'm a lifeguard and I'm a thousand years old. Chris refused to get out of the water. I'm at Mesa Golfland. I have a gentleman that will not leave the park. Where is he at? He's currently in the Lazy River. Um, the rest of the story goes on that your officers wheeled him out in a, um, in a wheelchair. And then he ends up on the hot pavement when he refused to comply with com commands by your officers. That's correct. And then we interviewed you about it and said, well, did, did they follow protocol? And you stand by your officers, don't you? Yes, sir. They did everything by the book. I actually think they did more than a lot of people would have done. I mean, they actually went and found a wheelchair when he was uncooperative and wouldn't, wouldn't walk and rolled him out. Um, and he was soaking wet in clothes, and when he started to lash out, try to strike the officers. He did um, try to strike them. Yeah, he tried to, I think it was a headbutt they chid or kicked at him, and they had to They had to make a choice. You know, you have different levels of force that you can use. Uh, you can, uh, one of the officers, I think, actually threatened to tase him, and he said something like, go ahead and light me up or something. Uh, and yeah, give me the lightning. Give me the, the quote. lightning, you're right. right. Give me the lightning. Um, and, he, and the officer says, well, you know, this obviously isn't a great idea, so. How do you know when you're, when you guys are out there, and you dealt with this in Phoenix, how do you know whether a guy's on drugs or they're mentally ill, how do you know what you're dealing with? Well, you don't most of the time. And in, in fact, this guy, albeit he uh, allegedly wasn't on drugs, uh, and that he had some uh, mental issues, those were not even diagnosed by the professional medical staff that saw him over and over during the next period of days that he went to hospitals. Uh, they missed it as well. So, I mean, for my officers to miss it, it's not surprising. Tell me what, it, just give me an overarching on this. Um, you know, we get called on stuff. Uh, lawyers will call us, um, plaintiffs will call us, and they'll say, look, I was harmed in this, this, and this by the police. Is there a cautionary tale for the media on something like this? Well, 
If they call you uh, first, I would find that unusual because I think all police agencies, especially in the West here, we're very professional. We, we have professional standards bureaus. We have internal affairs bureaus. We do investigate those uh, complaints against our officers. And this, we, was, this was handled internally as well. You guys had an internal investigation. That's right? correct. And we, there's, there's, this isn't TV. There's no cover-ups. Uh, we hold our people accountable to the highest level. We have to be. You know, municipal policing only works off of one system, and that is a level of trust. You can have all the laws in the world, but if no Nobody believes you're enforcing them correctly you are powerless as a police department and the reason that we have such a great relationship with our communities here in Arizona is because our officers are honest they're forthright and they have a trust level with the communities let me ask you a bit about your predecessor George Gascon who was a uh guest on this program several times before he went to uh, Oakland I believe or San Francisco, San Francisco. Uh, George Gascon was an interesting guy because he got very involved in the politics of SB 1070 he got kind of front and center. That's yes, really not your style, is it? And is that by design that you don't want to, you want to stay out of the political as much as possible? I do, and, and by design I haven't been in the media a lot. Um, I try not to make this job about me because it's not about me. It's about the men and women that I represent and it's about the community in which we serve. Um, and the debate that Sheriff Joe Arpaio and George Gascon got into. I don't think it, in, in the long run it wasn't healthy for any of them, and it definitely wasn't healthy for the community or the state. What did you learn from that? <laughs> well, you learn a lot of things, but uh, the big deal is... You were watching it from Phoenix at the time, obviously. Did you say, boy, if I ever become a chief, I'm not going to get involved in stuff like this? Absolutely. It doesn't, it, it's not, again, it becomes about you, and it looks, it's a media frenzy, and it, it's a distracting to the mission which you're trying to accomplish. And what makes me successful as the Mesa Police Chief is the men and women that work for me. Uh, without their hard work, uh, I am not successful. If you've been around a while in the Valley, uh, Frank Milstead's father was Ralph Milstead, the head of DPS, uh, Colonel Milstead. And uh, when we come back with Frank, we're going to talk a little bit about what you learned from your father sure. on Newsmaker Sunday with Frank Milstead, Chief of Mesa Police, back in a minute. Next time on SVU, Blair Underwood guest stars. That did not happen. Why haven't you arrested him? An ugly custody battle. I made you! Why did you recant? With partners taking sides. The guy never touched his wife. Until last night. But was this really an assault? Law and Order, SVU. Viewer discretion advised. Monday at 7 on My45. With Tracy gone, TGS will be airing another best of special. Actually, legal says we can't use the word best. Next time on 30 Rock. Monday at 10 on My45. Thinking of bankruptcy? Need to stop creditor calls? Is it really possible to raise the bills and get a fresh start? Yes, it is. We can talk to your creditors today. Call 1-800-BANKRUPT. On the next Big Bang Theory. I move our relationship terminate immediately. Seconded. There being no objections? <laughs> Breaking up is hard to do. Hey. Oh, no. <laughs> next Big Bang. Monday at 6 on My45. Order. Order in the court. I love saying that. Knowing the law is so important. I gave you a whole lesson in the law. Free. It could really come in handy. Are there any other crimes you guys want to admit to? Duh. My45 is your one-stop shop for all things court. Divorce court, Judge Alex, and back-to-back -back episodes of Judge Judy. Makes me feel cozy and comfy. A good time was had by all. Court's in session on My45, starting at 11 a.m. All objections are overruled. Back on Newsmaker Sunday with uh, Mesa Police Chief Frank Milstead. I met you first on a ride along. Yeah. When I first started here in Phoenix, I was 93, and I did a ride along with you. And I can't remember what we did, but we went out in some gang infested <laughs> area, I believe. We were. We were. In fact, I think we had a cameraman on the hood of the police car, which was <laughs> ill advised. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we did. Getting a shot of you driving. Correct. That is exactly right. Good yeah. memory. Yeah, it was ill advised, but we did it anyway. <laughs> right. Uh, and that may have been Rick Davis, actually, and his, his father, of course, uh, mm -hmm. uh, passed away in the line of duty for Correct. Phoenix Police. Let me ask you, you, you've been in the, you try to stay out of the, out of the media, but you got involved in this thing with your, your top-ranking female police officer, Kathy Kirkham. Um, and she ended up terminated, but this is somebody you were close to at one point. Where does that case stand now? It has been resolved. Uh, it's Settled? Uh, yes. And that's it? 
Yeah, that's, we'll learn about it shortly. Yeah, that's all I'm going to really comment on that. Uh, it's just an unfortunate set of circumstances. Um, your dad was also in some controversy during the Evan Meekham impeachment. He became embroiled in this whole thing when he was director of DPS. What did your dad teach you? Because he saw very high profile um, coverage, and some of it not very pleasant. No, and I think everyone gets tossed in the barrel uh, now and then, especially when, uh, as you rise up in organizations, you become a, a larger target. Um, I'll tell you, a regret of my father's uh, was, and it was actually written about when I became the chief in Mesa, which I found odd, and uh, Paul Rubens was the one who wrote the story New out of, of New Times. Sure. And, uh, and he, there was a picture of my dad uh, at Squaw Peak. He, my dad was a, a very avid hiker and athlete, and he had yes. his shirt off. And I remember in, that yeah. picture, sure. And he said, you know, I wished I had never done that. And this is actually when he was, he, he's been gone now for 17 years, and these are conversations we had while he was passing on. And he said, you know, that was one of my big regrets um, that I ever did that. He goes, uh, and so staying out of the media is, I think, better to a point but on the other end people need to see your face and know who you are and have that level of trust for you so when something odd does happen something mm -hmm. unusual happens they at least are familiar with you and, and know you so it's not such a, a surprise so you're finding that balance uh, yes sir what would you like to tell the people at Mesa who maybe haven't had a chance to meet you or talk to you what would you like to let them know about what's happening in your city well, the first thing is, this is the best job I ever had. Um, I've never worked this many hours, I've never worked this hard, um, but to, to lead an organization uh, at, at, of, of this magnitude is, uh, is a true dream. Uh, and I owe that to the mayor and city manager for selecting me to, to, to run the department. Um, but we are very careful about our staffing model uh, and our crime models because we have limited lean staffing. Response times? Response times are great. Uh, we're around four minutes. Uh, we're right at the national average. Even with reduced staff? Yes. Um, we continue to, we're in the process now of pushing more officers out to patrol. Uh, they're running call to call to call. Um, but our Does crime that suggest you can operate leaner and meaner? Well, it takes a toll because it, it takes a toll on the men and women that are doing the job. Uh, there's no agility in the workforce. It's hard to get time off. It's hard for them to do other things. But on the interim, we've asked them to work on street level drug arrests. We've asked them because drugs drive crime in the right. city. And, and right now, property crime and violent crime in Mesa is at a 60 year low. Let me just ask you quickly, we got to wrap. Do you believe drugs should be legalized? Do you think that would take pressure off or would it exacerbate the problem? No, I think they should not be legalized, and I think it's going to be worse as the more and more happens. One more question. Will you come back? Absolutely. Okay, great to see you. Thank Chief you, Milstead, sir. Great to see you. Appreciate your time, and thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Sunday this week.